questions now? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. We should have a really interesting discussion on thoracoscopic management of pericardial disease. Uh, before we get to that, I'm just going to uh, start with a shout out um, for uh, the meeting coming up, the World Veterinary Endoscopy and Minimally Invasive Surgery meeting. Uh, that's gonna be hosted uh, by CSU's uh, Translational Medicine Institute uh, this summer from June 28th to 30th. Um, so it'd be great to, to see a lot of participation there. And the deadline for abstract submission uh, has actually been extended to March 1st. Um, so if you are interested in submitting, you still have time and uh, you can find that information uh, on the TMI website for Colorado State University. Um, and with that, I can um, go ahead and make some uh, quick introductions of who will be speaking, hopefully speaking tonight. Um, so we're working out a couple of technical glitches, but hopefully uh, Bill Culp will be joining us shortly. Uh, and he is uh, faculty on the soft tissue surgery service at University of California at Davis. And there he is. Welcome. And, um, and then Brad Case uh, from the University of Florida, soft tissue surgery service as well. Uh, we should have a really good discussion with both of them about um, how to manage uh, pericardial disease minimally invasively and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks so much, Dr. Sharf. Hopefully, uh, hopefully y'all can hear me. Uh, is it is it working? I was having some issues before. We can hear you, I think. You, your video still appears a bit frozen, but less frozen now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. If Bill, if you we so we were gonna have Bill kind of start things off. So maybe if you want to give it a shot, but if it doesn't work, then I can just I can just start it and go with it and then see what happens. That'd be My great. My cat can also pinch hit if okay. we need to substitute. Okay, cool. If you guys can hear me, I will. All right, well, hopefully if you can hear me, I will try to share my screen here and see if this is gonna work okay. All right. Well, thanks so much. Uh, hopefully you all can hear me now. And if not, uh, Brad, feel free to just start taking over uh, to, to chat. And I really looking forward to it. Uh, talking, you know, have um, tried to incorporate into our practices, Brad, especially with a lot of the research and things that he's done and, and really some of the interesting techniques and things that he's developing. But um, would love to uh, chat a little bit with everybody today about some, some, uh, some of the things that we were thinking as in terms of pericardial procedures. And so um, moving forward today, we wanted to start, I think um, I, I was lost for a little bit, but I'm sure Dr. Scharf mentioned this. We just wanted to give a little shout out for the upcoming First World Veterinary Endoscopy Society meeting in Fort Collins. So something definitely to check out and uh, something that we're all very excited about and should be a really great opportunity um, for us all to, to hopefully get together and, and do some more discussion about these different min minimally invasive procedures. Um, so I'm just going to start with giving a little bit of an overview and some um, outline for um, some of these procedures. And then uh, we thought that we might make it into kind of a, a mini panel of sorts where we try to uh, pose some of the questions that we thought would be uh, interesting to discuss in, in some of the updates for pericardial surgery and then um, have uh, Brad give some of the, the background and some of the ways that he's using some of those techniques, I think, to, to um, um, consider some of these newer options or just to try to answer some of these questions that are out there um, that still exist for pericardial surgery. So as far as a, a quick overview here, just a couple slides. When we're thinking about pericardial disease and what we might be treating with um, thoracoscopic pericardial surgery, we kind of think of these four major large categories and the categories of, of what um, has been done and then where we're going to take this into the future. And so there's the idiopathic diseases that we're treating and most commonly we're going to try to, um, in those cases, get a look uh, within the pericardium when we can do pericardioscopy and then perform the pericardiectomy uh, in those cases and, and kind of dependent on what the what we assume or what we're thinking maybe the underlying situation is there that might influence what direction we go as far as the type of pericardium 
pericardi um, pericardiectomy that we do. Sometimes we're just um, pericardiectomy and, uh, uh, you know, obviously that might include some of these cases where um, Brad's going to show some cool um, videos of auriculectomy cases and things that he's done as well. Um, but oftentimes for the malignancies, a window is sufficient in order to open up the pericardium and allow us to um, have uh, uh, some drainage from the pericardium in those particular cases. The chylus effusions, I think, are one of the more interesting um, uh, techniques that we're, uh, that you know, people are performing pericardectomy for and, and one of the ones where there's um, uh, still some controversy as far as what to do with those types of cases uh, and how you manage them. I think for the most part, um, those are oftentimes managed with subphrenic or fillet. And I think that I'm hearing a little bit more um, from Brad here in a minute about his approach to that, I think will be uh, um, uh, an interesting talking point as well. And then lastly, for the restrictive cases, we're oftentimes doing subphrenics and those trying to remove as much pericardium as possible in those cases to try to relieve um, any of that uh, um, um, tightening down that's occurring around the heart in those particular cases. As far as um, just some quick overview, I'm sure everyone on here uh, is doing these cases regularly, so we weren't going to um, go into a ton of detail about the actual um, setup and, and things for these types of cases, but just to give a quick overview about uh, how we do, uh, what we do for some of our cases. In general, for these cases, um, we have the patients in dorsal recumbency. Um, oftentimes, you're on the side of the patient um, that uh, uh, um, is most comfortable for you. So for instance, for a, a right-handed person, oftentimes they're on the right side of the dog and vice versa um, with the uh, monitors up towards the front of the patient, the cranial aspect of the patient to um, allow them to be able to look straight uh, into the monitors in those particular uh, cases. As far as the port position, most commonly we use, um, we tend to do a three uh, port placement um, with the uh, first port of the camera port being placed either subxiphoid or paraxiphoid. Uh, to allow us to look at, at both sides of the chest uh, um, fairly, re fairly readily in those particular situations. Um, and then there's alternative approaches where you can place multiple portals on one side. Um, there's also a, a lateral recumbency technique described as well, which is not something for, for pericardectomy that I have done personally, but I'm curious to hear if anyone else has done that or, or Brad as well or Val, um, if you guys have any comments on that. Um, but in general, my port position is just like it, it looks down there on the lower left where we place um, the camera port subxiphoid or paraxiphoid. And then we have uh, two instrument ports, one on the left side and one on the right side, usually somewhere in that six to eight intercostal space to allow us to have good access to the pericardium. Um, we tend to use an optical entry uh, technique for getting our um, camera port in position. And so for uh, this particular situation, usually we make that one centimeter skin incision uh, in the paraxiphoid position and then uh, um, use our uh, trocar and um, thoracal port uh, or endotip cannula to um, uh, be able to create the a port that's there. And we're watching the whole time with the camera as the camera, you're driving in the port in that particular situation and you're able to see with the camera the entire time until you know for sure that you're in the thoracic cavity. Uh, and it seems to be just a nice way to uh, be able to have a safe entry and a, a way to try to limit having um, complications just with the insertion of the port. And then um, for each of the instrument ports, again, as much as we can have direct visualization of this as possible, we try to do that. Um, and so we use uh, um, some palpation to kind of find where we're gonna uh, introduce that and then um, use our hemostats, a, a blade on the skin and then hemostats to try to initially create our hole um, through the chest wall and then have our um, uh, cannula gonna go through that hole as well. Okay, so with that as a little bit of an introduction and overview, um, start to kick it off here with maybe some of the major topics that we thought um, hopefully that um, attendees tonight might be interested in and um, try to uh, ask some questions. Again, try to have like a little bit of a, a mini panel discussion here um, and then uh, kind of go from there. So the first topic that we were gonna raise was pericardioscopy. And so I was gonna throw a few questions Brad's way and, and he has uh, um, um, some thoughts on different ways that he's using pericardioscopy. He's really um, written some of the, the major papers on this and really done some really interesting things. So um, just in general, things that I, I often think about is, is what do you potentially see as advantages of pericardioscopy and, and how do you incorporate these uh, pericardioscopy in your cases? And then what is uh, your technique for doing this? 
in a way that uh, uh, is most effective and in a way where you feel like you get the most out of it. And so with that, um, love to hear your thoughts on that, Brad, and pass it off to you. Thanks, Bill. Um, <clears throat> should I, uh, can I share screen now? Will it just switch automatically or do you have to facilitate that CT? You should be able to share the screen now. Okay, let's try that. It says, uh, this will stop others. Yes, continue. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, you know, I guess before I get going, let me uh, uh, just say thank you to Dr. Sharf, CT Bill, um, for hosting this. And um, thanks to everyone. I just panned through the list of attendees and recognized quite a few of them. Um, and it looks like there's a whole variety of kind of young up and comers and, you know, some of the people that trained me, which Dr. Monet is on here. And he pretty much gets to take sole credit for me being here talking about this particular topic tonight. He put me up to it, so to speak. Um, and uh, I want to recognize Bill. Bill's very modest and, uh, you know, deferring everything to me. But Bill was uh, doing his uh, Ankh fellowship while I was a resident. And he helped me out a ton uh, during my residency. And so I'm always uh, definitely appreciative of everyone who came before and, you know, sort of helped mentor me. And then obviously I'm honored here to have Dr. Sharf here too, um, who I got to work with quite a bit and get to know very well. So uh, thanks to everyone. Um, generally, you know, Bill basically posed the question, um, and I know many of you uh, on here know this, but you know, what is pericardioscopy and how do you use it? But I generally tell us a bit of a story. So it's pretty early, it's 8, 10. The story is fairly, sh I can make the story very short. I can make it long too, but I'll keep it to about a 12 minute story and basically kind of set up you know, how this sort of topic found its way into our world, uh, recognizing as was brought up on the listserv, I think a couple of days ago, that the concept has been around for years on the human side. It's just that we haven't really recognized it as a specific entity and then, uh, you know, sort of applied it and, and did study specific to that, that concept. So hopefully I can uh, fill in some of those blanks, at least from my perspective, and then we'll get... Uh, you know, good. there's lots of talent on here. So maybe we'll get some discussion and then, or maybe we'll move to some more questions. But um, the first thing to sort of recognize, in my opinion, is uh, this paper that I did with Dr. Monet as I was uh, uh, leaving my residency. And basically it was a retrospective comparing uh, thoracotomy to thoracoscopy for dogs undergoing pericardiectomies. And there is another difference. The dogs that were going, undergoing thoracoscopy just got a pericardial window, which is basically approximately four by four centimeter apically placed window, right? Um, these dogs were compared to dogs that underwent thoracotomy that had a pericardectomy and it was, uh, they were all exclusively subphrenic or near subphrenic. So different approach and slightly different uh, methodology. But the interesting thing is that when you looked at their um, diagnoses, and many of these were diagnoses based strictly on the fact that there was a mass on echocardiography or something was seen intraoperatively, not necessarily always with histopath, we saw that the difference um, was significant between the two groups and that we were seeing a lot fewer idiopathics in the thoracotomy group that were undergoing pericardectomies versus the thoracoscopy where we had a lot more idiopathics, okay? So that's kind of interesting. Um, when you looked at how these dogs did, um, whether they had a thoracoscopic window or a subphrenic by a thoracotomy, if they had a neoplastic diagnosis, either by uh, there was a auricular mass or there was histopath, they did the same. Pretty poor long-term outcome, but no difference. But the interesting thing was that the dogs that underwent thoracotomy that were ultimately diagnosed with idiopathic pericardial effusion had perfect survival. Um, versus the ones that underwent a thoracoscopic pericardial window and were tentatively diagnosed as idiopathic did much worse. So that, that posed a question um, that we needed to answer. And the question was, well, why were these dogs doing worse? And so, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, leading theories, uh, the first being that, okay, somehow this small pericardial window was not, you know, palliating these dogs' clinical signs in the long term. Maybe it was sealing back down to the epicardium, something like that, or more likely, we just missed the diagnosis, okay? And so this, again, was sort of the impetus for starting to look into this a bit, uh, a bit 
um, more in depth. Okay, and then one of the um, other things to realize for especially for the the residents and kind of young surgeons out there is that you know every test we do obviously has limitations, but with echocardiography, the negative predictive value is you know there's limitations to it. You're going to probably miss two out of ten, at least according to this classic paper by Dr. McDonald out of UC Davis where uh, the sensitivity was only 82%. So, you know, about two in 10, we're gonna get a false negative diagnosis, okay? For not finding a mass. So there was something there, just didn't show up. Conversely, if there was something there and it was diagnosed, it was never a false positive, okay? So that is another key to the story that I think we need to uh, be aware of. Um, the other thing is that this uh, whole, uh, you know, conundrum has already been experienced on the human side. They see uh, sort of cryptic, elusive pathologies, malignant pathologies like primary mesothelial pericardial uh, neoplasia, and it masquerades as this chronic pericarditis syndrome. And for years, in many cases, it's a diagnostic uh, you know, challenge. People can't figure it out. They, they call it an immune reactive pericarditis, but it keeps coming back despite the typical treatments, et cetera. And things that they've discovered, similar to what we're discovering is that echocardiography, CT, are not particularly sensitive for diagnosing small lesions or non-mass forming uh, lesions, okay? So um, things like pericarditis via, uh, you know, pericardioscopy biopsy of the uh, visceral aspect of the pericardium have also led to false negative diagnoses, okay? Um, so that's uh, uh, something that we need to be aware of. Um, pericardioscopy, like I mentioned earlier, and like was brought up uh, on the listserv a few days ago, again, has been around for decades on the human side. It's been done with rigid endoscopy and then more recently with flexible uh, scopes. And it's kind of, they kind of do a hybrid procedure. They use fairly large 14, 16 gauge introducer sheaths. And they do this under fluoro and they run a flexible scope in there with a biopsy channel and they explore the pericardial space looking for you know epicardial lesions uh, heart-based lesions visceral pericardial lesions and they biopsy and get fluid samples and acquire as much uh, sampling as they can to try and uh, better characterize the pathologies that they see this is a you know a, a, from a paper um, that i like to reference and i think it's a pretty useful paper but it basically looks at the kind of breakdown of the diagnoses that they come up with uh, using pericardioscopy and targeted biopsy, um, as well as a bunch of post sample uh, analyses, including you know, cytology, fluid analysis, uh, culture, uh, viral PCR, immunohistochemistry, et cetera. And they look for all sorts of different viral causes, which to my knowledge, no one's really uh, endeavored to look at, but you know, Epstein-Barr virus, human parvovirus, uh, HIV virus, which is rarely a cause, uh, adenovirus. Um, there's a whole bunch of different viral panels they run to ultimately get to a diagnosis of uh, lymphocytic viral positive or lymphocytic viral negative. And you can see that's the bottom and green uh, sections of the pie here. And then they have their kind of treatment. They basically infuse genomycin, this group does anyway, into the pericardial space. And if it's a viral negative, that's all they do. If it's, uh, a vi or if it's a viral positive, um, that's all they'll do. If it's, vi if it's a, a viral PCR negative, then they'll add in triamcinolone, okay? And that's that, that big red uh, sliver right there. So those are the cases that they're seeing that we would call, although they don't use this terminology anymore, true idiopathics, okay? Um, Another interesting part of this puzzle is that we know that uh, these sort of uh, insidious pathologies like pericardial mesothelioma can develop slowly. And there's this classic uh, five case case series by Dr. Mashita at all that looked at uh, five uh, golden retrievers that had clinical signs for quite a long time. Three underwent surgery ultimately and two underwent necropsy. And their anti-mortem diagnoses were all idiopathic uh, pericard pericarditis, pericardial fusion, but their post-surgical or surgical or, or uh, post-mortem diagnoses were all mesothelioma. Okay, so we see that similar sort of uh, disease uh, in our dogs. So, uh, you know, looking into all that literature and then considering that first study that uh, Dr. Monet and I did, the question was, okay, well, are we just missing the diagnoses? How can we better improve things? And what are the limitations of the pericardial window? So 
Um, a surgical intern who's now a faculty at uh, Missouri, uh, Dr. Owen Skinner, who probably many people know, and I did this you know, simple cadaver study where we basically made pericardial windows with a scope, came up with a rough kind of uh, scoring system to look at all the intrapericardial structures, how well they could be visualized. And then we independently scored them. And then we agreed on a score, which we were pretty much in agreement uh, for most things. And then we converted it to a subphrenic pericardectomy and redid the scoring. And not, you know, for those of you that have seen this, it's not a surprise, but what we found was that with just a four by four centimeter apically placed pericardial window, it was very hard to see anything in the pericardial space, especially up on the aortic root and the oracle, you could barely see them. And that's about where 80% plus of your malignant pathologies are gonna be. So with a pericardial window alone, it's really hard to do a, a proper pericardial explore or pericardioscopic explore. So that was kind of the conclusion from there. And that, that was the results from it. Um, a few years, a few years later, um, the group from a UGA did a study in uh, dogs without any pericardial pathology, but they basically, these were live dogs and the first group had a pericardial window similar to what I just described. And the second group had pericardial window plus fillet, which Dr. Radlinski and Dr. Allman described in a chylothorax paper from, I think I want to say 2010, somewhere around there. But they just, in, in this study, it was an experimental study. They wanted to look, okay, if we compare this window to this window with fillet, what do we see? And they found similar uh, findings as what I just uh, referenced. With the pericardial window, you were limited with exposure of the epicardial surface compared to the uh, pericardial window with the fillet. And for those of you who don't know what that procedure is, the fillet is simply the addition of sort of banana peel incisions down towards the phrenics on both sides, cranial. Um, up near the heart base. Okay, so you, you make a, a simpler, a technically simpler procedure, the wind over compared to a subphrenic, and then you add on these little slits down to the right, down to the left, and cranial. And that's the pericardial window with fillet. Um, around the same time, we were uh, gathering our cases over the last seven years or so from a number of institutions where we knew we were all performing pericardioscopy. Um, the size of the pericardectomy was not important, but these were all idiopathic or tentative idiopathic dogs um, that had had a pericardioscopic explore, and we wanted to see how they did. So my uh, current resident and master student, uh, Dr. Carvajal, who does an amazing job and is working on some more cool stuff with us now, uh, headed this up is long with, along with uh, UC Davis, Guelph, UPenn, and then um, uh, our university. So we went back and looked at our cases and the inclusion criteria was, did they have pericardial effusion and was there no mass on echo? If the boxes checked yes, then they got to be included. If there was a mass on echo, they were excluded. So we ended up with 18 dogs and we went through and did pericardiectomy, pericardioscopy, and looked to see if there was any observable pathology. Because on the human side, they describe a number of uh, pathologic changes uh, that you see pericardioscopically. Uh, raised neovascular lesions that bleed easily are correlated with the diagnosis of malignancy. Uh, there's a couple other things that they see that are simply gross observations that correlate with uh, diagnosis of malignancy. So we looked at our findings. Obviously, we submitted, uh, you know, any kind of uh, biopsyable masses, whether they be on the pericardium or the epicardium for uh, histopathology, um, as well as culture and uh, susceptibility in most cases. Uh, and then we um, got our diagnosis. So uh, when you looked at these cases, um, they were all sort of typical cases. A lot of them were large breed. Many of them were golden retriever or Labrador dogs. So dogs that you might think predisposed to some of these uh, pathologies and clinical signs were consistent with what's been reported. But the more interesting thing is that when you looked at the 18 cases, the um, you look at the row over to the left, the pericardioscopy row, nine of them had nodules small nodules or obvious masses or nodules and adhesions. Okay, all nine of these first nine did. 10 through 18 didn't have anything remarkable. The pericardium was fairly normal. There was no nodules anywhere, no adhesions, nothing. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't know there was anything wrong. Okay, when you look at how they did their outcome, the first four, we ended up getting a histopathologic diagnosis of uh, neoplasia. And you look at their survival, it's what you would expect, not very good. The second four of the group with abnormalities found, 
Um, we didn't get a histopathologic diagnosis. And again, maybe just grossly looking at the survival, you know, not good, a couple of them did okay. But look at the, the subsequent nine where we didn't see any pathology with the pericardioscopic explore and we didn't get anything um, too exciting on histopath for the most part. Look at the survivals, markedly better. So we plotted these out in a, a survival curve or product limit curve. And the dashed line are the uh, dogs that had pathology on pericardioscopy, irrespective of their histopathologic diagnosis. And then the dark line are the dogs that were, had an unremarkable pericardioscopic exam. And notice that there were only two failures in the pericardioscopic group. Those failures were not fail, and they were, they were at the long term. The first one was over a year before it failed. They were not failures because the dogs developed some type of you know, malignancy or something. They were specifically two small dogs that had recurrent pleural effusion that the owners eventually got sick of um, tapping or the dogs were not doing well. And they thought it was putting the dogs through a lot to have them coming back for recurrent taps, but neither of them were diagnosed with a uh, malignancy. Okay. So that's pretty interesting. Um, I put two graphs up here. One is uh, another graph from Dr. Carvajal's study that we were just talking about. And then the other was from a study that I mentioned earlier that I did with Dr. Monet that kind of created this whole thing. Um, in uh, the study with Dr. Carvajal, when you just looked at the histopathologic diagnosis, excluding the pericardioscopic diagnoses, we couldn't separate out how the dogs were going to do. We couldn't prognosticate. They'd you know, you couldn't tell if there was a difference between the idiopathic ones or neoplastic ones. So that sort of said, okay, well, geez, the pericardioscopic findings look to be a little bit more predictive or prognostic uh, than just purely looking at histopath of the pericardium. And then uh, when you go back to that earlier study that uh, I did with Dr. Monet, when you just look at echocardiography, like I mentioned earlier, and you use that sort of as your criteria to see is there a mass or not a mass, also you can't um, separate out prognosis that way. So what this basically, when you put all this stuff together, this I'll shut up here in a second. Um, when you put all this together, I think what you can definitely say is that the concept of pericardioscopy, making sure however you do your pericardectomy, whether it be a fillet, a window, a large window, subphrenic, making sure that you have some sort of um, strategy or, you know, almost like how we talk about explores of the abdomen, make them routine, have some sort of technique that you use where you go and you look at all these places, especially up at the heart base, the visceral side of the pericardium, the pleura, you know, just look everywhere, have a, uh, have a, a strategy that you use to do your explores and use that information to look for areas you can target for biopsy. That is going to improve your ability to diagnose pathology uh, compared to just doing a window, submitting it for uh, histopath and crossing your fingers. Um, so I think that kind of covers, you know, those first uh, two. And then finally, you know, after, you know, um, Dr. Monet and I published that paper, a lot of people said, well, I'm not doing thoracoscopy for um, effusions anymore. We can't do it because they do worse. Well, I don't think that's really true. I think um, we can, you know, with the evidence that we have now and the understanding we have now, recommend pericardiectomy and pericardioscopy for those dogs with, uh, you know, presumptive idiopathic effusions, again, as long as we're being thoughtful um, and purposeful and, and thorough uh, in how we approach them. So that is where I will um, stop. And I, and I, I, you know, I guess there's still a part of Bill's question yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to follow up on that, Brad. Thank you for that. I think, you know, you did a, a great job kind of overview with, with you know, the importance of it. And I think that's uh, I, that's the biggest thing I was hoping to to hear and, and to highlight. Do you have any kind of tips or are there things that you do as far as patient positioning or changes that you make um, on a case-by-case -case basis or differences that you see with different breeds, things like that, that you might do differently to, to have the most effective pericardioscopy or, or do you, are you able to pretty much do a similar technique with most of the cases you see? Yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, I don't have like a, you know, a checklist where I, or a written out algorithm. I just make sure that um, I can see all the areas of interest really well. So the areas of interest to me are, the epicardial surface specifically up on the, the aortic root, um, 
looking carefully at the right oracle. I even look at the tip of the left oracle. Um, not that I've ever seen anything interesting on it. Um, definitely the surface uh, of the epicardium. And I, I try to pay really careful attention to the visceral aspect of the pericardium because I've seen, you know, it's, it's really hard to see the outside, the, the parietal surface, because it's like loaded with fat, it's thick um, in some of these dogs with chronic effusions and stuff. But the visceral side, sometimes you can see little focal uh, nodules and things. So I make absolutely sure that I'm looking there and really go make sure that I'm getting those areas in my biopsies. And I'll even point those out, you know, or call them out for the pathologist when I'm submitting them. Um, and we've got, we got some videos of that sort of stuff in here. Um, and then I look at the pleural surface too. Um, I know that uh, we've had discussions about this in the past about, you know, the pericardium coming up nil not seeing, you know, not getting anything on a targeted biopsy. And, and then you get a, a, a plural biopsy and boom, because you see this little nodule there and you get a diagnosis there or um, sternal lymph node removal. I've taken a few of those out. That's largely been unrewarding for the uh, uh, idiopathic effusions that I suspect there might be something. Um, although in one of the cases we had uh, that uh, Dr. Carvajal uh, published, there was a pre-scap lymph node that was biopsied, I wanna say like six months, eight months after the diagnosis and came back with, uh, they, they gave it a highly suspected di uh, diagnosis of mesothelioma based on their metastatic mesothelioma there. So I don't have a like, you know, you know, like when I describe abdominal explore clockwise, I don't really have that. I just make sure I go and look at all those areas. And some dogs are big, some dogs are small. So my pericardia, pericardectomy varies in how big it is. Um, but I, I do like, you know, sort of doing kind of a, a technically easy window and then filleting it when I can, because I think that that accomplishes what you want. I don't know. What, what do you guys think? No, yeah. I think that's great. Yeah, go ahead, Val, please. Oh, well, I was just going to, yeah, throw in there too. Um, this is, you mentioned the size, uh, some big, some dogs are big and some are small. This is not a question we've gotten yet tonight, but I know I've been asked this by others in terms of, you know, minimum size cutoff. I wonder what thoughts you guys have. I tend to not go by size so much as confirmation and, you know, barrel chest versus deep chest on these guys, but wondered if, if you have thoughts in terms of, how small is too small, or is that not such a thing? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go first. I, I totally agree. I, I have the same kind of thought process. I mean, the, the biggest issues or challenges that I've had as far as being able to get through the procedure have been usually the brachycephalic breeds or those dogs that just have like zero room between their pericardium or their heart and the, and the sternum. And so that's... Um, uh, yeah, Nicole just posted that English Bulldogs are the hardest. I totally agree. I think that's, uh, those are the ones that I know that I've converted and, and had some really hard, hard times with. Yeah, that's been my experience as well. I think one of the hardest ones I had was a Mastiff, honestly, which is a bit of an embarrassment to admit because they're so big, but it's really more the, the confirmation. Yep. Totally agree. Well, maybe uh, uh, one, one other quick question, Brad, just to kind of follow up on that is, you know, you're mentioning getting your biopsies and things during your pericardioscopy um, or doing during that process. Any thoughts on, on how to do that effectively or what instrumentation you use? Um, I mean, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, for the pericardectomy, that's a no brainer. I think everybody, you know, uh, uses bipolar devices when possible or, uh, you know, scissors, if it's a thin pericardium is not particularly pathologic. I think you can get away with scissors because, you know, there's not much bleeding there. <clears throat> well, we may mention it or not, but, you know, there are some anecdotal and some published reports of ventricular fibrillation during bipolar pericardectomies out there. So I'm always super duper careful. Um, I use a brand new ligature or a harmonic device of some type when I'm doing my pericardectomies now. I won't use a reused one just because, I mean, we don't know why that's happened. I mean, maybe it's just chance, but I know of three or four uh, people that have experienced that. And I'd, I'd like to not experience it if possible. Um, when, uh, you know, trying to do epicardial biopsies, that's, that can be scary. Um, maybe I'll pull up a video of a couple of cases I've done. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm a believer that surgery is variable depending, you know, kind of like what you're just talking about with the confirmation versus you know, size cutoff or whatever. 
where you look at it and you go, okay, what are my options and what's unique about this and what makes the most sense? I, I feel like I do that all the time. And it's not like, oh, I read in a book to use this instrument for this, you know? So I'll show, I'll show that video for the Oracle. I mean, a stapler. And, um, you know, I, I think that's pretty much, I mean, maybe somebody's used a loop ligature or something. I, I've not done that. Um, I've used linear staplers and then articulating linear staplers. And um, I, that's what I would go to for the Oracle. So that, that generally, or, you know, maybe if you're biopsying the pleural punch biopsy is fine. Um, I think we got a video of that in there. The sternal lymph node, I use kind of like a grasper right angles or curved Kelly's and a bipolar device typically. So there's all videos of all that stuff. If anybody wants to, to see that, we can pull that up, but that's generally what I do. No, I think that's a good transition. Why don't we um, go into some of the auriculectomy stuff uh, and um, kind of show some of those videos and, and things if that's okay with you. I'll, uh, I'll bring up video, I'll bring up my presentation. And So one of the other things that we wanted to highlight um, is just um, as Brad was starting to talk about uh, is the use of um, incorporating obviously a, a different an anatomical part, but incorporating the use of pericardial surgery um, for these auriculectomy cases and then handling those cases as well as some other potential procedures um, requiring pericardial surgery. So um, I was hoping to have Brad kind of comment on that and, and, and talk a little bit more about what maybe you do preoperatively to, to assess these cases a little bit more as far as the cases that you think might be good candidates. And then what are your uh, game changers once you're intra-op that might make you change your plan up, either change your plan up and still try to do things with the thoracoscopic approach or potentially something where you might say, okay, I think this is a case we might need to convert it at that point. So I'll pass off uh, to you at this point, Brad. Uh, you want me to pull my video? Are you going to put the video up while I'm talking or do you yeah, want me to pull Do you want to pull, uh, do you want to pull yours up? I'll, I'll, I'll just pull it up. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm curious. I honestly, I'm curious to see what other people think about this. I think I've evolved quite a bit, um, with how I approach dogs with auricular masses, uh, with their client, with the clients. And, um, I, I think I get, pretty pessimistic, <clears throat> uh, more so now than I used to. Um, uh, where is it at here? See if I can even find what I'm talking about. Okay. Let's go with this one. Yeah. So, um, I think there, there are some dogs or, that I've gone and looked at the echo and there's quite a bit of effusion. You almost get the feeling by looking at the oracle and the mass that it's sort of apical and flopping around and so that's that's something that I look at um, I've used CT uh, to try and look and see if I can tell if the mass is more apical or how big it is even um, size usually I can kind of get a good feel for on CT and and echo and if it's getting up you know uh, Dr. Ployart and Monet published kind of the three centimeter ish kind of guideline. And I sort of agree. I mean, if it's getting up, you know, four, five, six centimeters, that's getting to be fairly big. Oracles are generally not that big. So that tells me that the mass is so big that it's probably involving the base. So I'm a little bit more pessimistic there. Um, so uh, in those cases, I might, uh, I might go look, but I'd probably warn the owner that it's not, there's a chance it's not going to be resectable or resectable thoracoscopically. Um, so I'll, I'll look for those things um, as a guide. And then um, a lot of the time the discussion is, well, uh, this is you know almost assuredly hemangiosarcoma um, if it's an auricular mass. Um, you know, the survivals are terrible with that, especially without, uh, even with um, uh, chemo and not surgery, they're not particularly good. And even with surgery, in many cases, they're, they're not good. You're talking days to weeks. 
So we have a discussion about euthanizing on the table and I, and I do that quite frequently. Um, I have had a few people say, well, I want you to open them up and try. And I generally don't like to go that approach um, uh, be because it's my opinion that uh, putting a dog through a thoracotomy or a sternotomy to try and remove or not an auricular mass or just do a pericardectomy is that's that's a pretty big surgery for days to weeks. Um, so I have a long talk with them. Ultimately, it's their dog and I let them decide. But um, I, I try to use the imaging to guide and I will almost always, if not always, talk them into putting the scope in to look first. And then hopefully it looks something like this, which is kind of a, you know, a, a two to three centimeter kind of apical uh, type mass that I can slide a stapler under. Um, and in that case, then I'll obviously, you know, remove the Oracle. Uh, and the hopes, the hope there is that, uh, you know, they're going to, they're going to be a motivated client, do follow up chemo. And then this takes the risk of, you know, hemorrhaging acutely out of the equation, because I'm convinced that's how a number of them, them die, uh, you know, with just doing a pericardectomy, uh, although that's not really well documented. So I don't know if that's, that's probably me blabbing more than anything to take to the bank, but you know, cause I think you, I've had cases, like I said, I just had one. A month ago, I was like, I think this one will be resectable looking at the CT and the echo and I was dead wrong. Um, the area that I thought was the apex was actually the base. It was the mass had twisted it and gave, gave it a funny, <clears throat> a funny sort of impression on CT. So I think it can be hard, but I'd be love to hear what other people have to say. Again, any thoughts on, do you change anything as far as your port position or adding ports or, or anything? What, what kind of strategies have you had to use in those situations to, to try to improve your chances when you want? I think the articulating stapler is key. Um, I think using the 45 length instead of the 60 length is key uh, because that anvil on the 60 is so big and fitting it in even like a, a medium to large breed dog can be very tough. So I think using, you know, a shorter stapler cartridge an articulating stapler. Um, I generally try to, uh, you know, kind of think three dimensionally. If I get my stapler in there and I can articulate it and I know my stapler's about this long and I know the mass is about right there, where should I put my port? So I generally will add one. I typically add them on the right. And it depends on, again, the size, or I guess, you know, as Dr. Sharp would say, the confirmation, um, you know, so I, I factor all of those things in, but some keys, use a shorter stapler anvil and use an articulating stapler because it can be hard to sort of maneuver a stapler in there. If you, if you just kind of come directly lateral at it, you, good luck getting your stapler in there. Is going to bang into it or you're going to tear it or something. So you got to be a little bit caudal. Um, and, you know, you got to kind of think about how long the, the stapler is and how much articulation can I get. But those, those are really the keys. You know, the pericardectomy, you know, you just need to make sure that you can see it well enough. So I incise all the way up cranially and, you know, I'll fillet down at least on the right side so I can see it and, uh, you know, do my, you know, explore, but these are no, no brainers. We know what this is. We know what we need to get. So we've maybe a, someone else has something more interesting. I was going to say, we've had a couple uh, questions and comments from the audience as well. So um, one question is um, whether you've attempted resection with a vessel sealing device and are you concerned about adjacent thermal injury? If so. You want to take that one, Bill? I would, but I've never tried that, <laughs> so I well, don't have a good it. answer for that. I personally have not, so I can't, yeah, I can't speak to that. My, my thought would be, I, I don't think I would be as concerned about the adjacent thermal injury, although the potential for arrhythmia would be there, um, so that, that would heighten it a bit. I think I would also have concerns about what I'm removing with it and, um, and the ceiling with that, uh, knowing that the vessel ceiling devices are typically labeled for five or 10 millimeter vessels. So I, I would be a little nervous about pushing it with that. I'm curious if anyone else has other experience. I have not, and I'm concerned about everything. <laughs> Paranoia is healthy. 
Um, and then we have a, a comment from uh, Dr. Monet as well, um, mentioning that he uses the pericardioscopy as a tool to decide what to do. So uh, auriculectomy with thoracoscopy or convert to thoracotomy or do nothing, uh, because again, it, it's hard to, to tell via echo, which I, yeah, I would I, agree with that. I'm curious from, uh, to hear from Dr. Monet, I can probably ask him myself, but since we're talking about it, um, like what is it about a mass you will see during pericardioscopy that makes you think, okay, I can't do this with a linear stapler thoracoscopically, but I can do it open. Because I, I think I just suck at open auriculectomy because I've only done a few. And so maybe I'm missing something. Hopefully he's furiously typing away to- I was oh, going to no, say, because we have a follow-up question great. as well, but uh, I don't want to get you off can track. Can you hear me? <laughs> I just allowed uh, Monet to speak as well. Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yep, yep, got you. Yeah, I like because for me, I don't know, in echocardiography, it's always hard to tell for sure. I mean, there's an obvious huge one, you know, you cannot do anything, but there has been quite a few cases where I went in after talking to the owner where I went in and say, hey, we'll use the scope and make a decision there. And making them open, sometimes it's easier to place your uh, stapler or if you have a bleeder, if you're open, then it's easier to control it versus converting. Okay, there are a few cases where I was able to make that decision by just looking at it with a scope and, and go from there. Thank That's you. Great. Thanks. And it looks like Dr. Monet also mentioned that he has done, uh, used the ligature to re remove a left oracle in, in some yeah, research I was, cases. I was involved in a research project with Medtronic, I mean, Covidium at the time, Valley Lab, where in sheep we had to do some resection of left atrial oracle. That was in some ideas for them to control arrhythmias. And it worked, but it wasn't sheep. So I don't know if we can mm -hmm. transfer that to dogs and we never induce any arrhythmias or cardiac arrest or anything with that stuff but i know it's only sheep so i have no idea if it will work in a dog and i haven't tried it in a dog either so don't try this at home yet <laughs> And I guess, you know, another good follow-up question too, in, in Brad's description of doing the auriculectomy uh, is, do you try to visualize the cranial vena cava before firing your staples? Yeah, I make sure I can see everything. I mean, I, I make sure I, I know where everything is before I do any kind of ligating or even clamping of the stapler. Yeah, and so that's another thing, you know, some of these longer chested dogs, um, that's still confirmational. See, I'm getting away from the size thing. Sometimes <laughs> I just can't get the scope from a sub xiphoid location cranial enough. So I'll switch to one of the intercostal to go up and look and make sure. That's a good question. That actually, yeah. so, oh, go ahead, Bill. No, 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 go, go for it. Well, mine, mine gets us off from that just a little bit, but from a positioning standpoint, I'm just curious if, um, I know we mentioned kind of standing laterally to the dog. Do you guys ever stand caudal? So on the, the back end of the table for these, uh, when you're doing the sub -cyphoid approach, I found that to sometimes be kind of ergonomic and I'll have the monitor just, uh, directly cranial. So I'll be kind of in a straight line, but, um, but I don't know if, if others have played with that. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, what I can say is I, uh, Mayhew, from doing cases with Phil, he does that often. And so I kind of learned to that from him where to kind of leave that caudal end or back end of the table uh, exposed. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, what, what he taught me basically is, is having your separate table set up for your equipment and everything kind of off to the side, leaving that hole from the left and right side of the dogs being exposed all the way around the back end, giving you the ability to do that. And it's like you said, it's really nice. It gives you the um, it changes your comfort, I think, for some of that. Uh, so I think that's a, a really good point you made. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a good Good demo of the positioning. So yeah, that would be more the lateral approach there. I was wondering if I'd picked that up from Brad at UF, but maybe not. I can't remember now. It's been too long. <laughs> yeah, I, I've always done it like this. Um, okay. 
you know, I can see like standing at the tail end of the table would be, be kind of nice, but this is just how I've always done it. Keep the assistant on one corner and me on the other corner. Seems comfortable enough for me. Okay. Yeah. Well, another good transition, Brad. Um, I think uh, I think with our time left, maybe if we tried to tackle one more topic, um, talking a little bit about Kylos, you had kind of started to touch on it a bit um, when you um, started to talk about doing subphrenic versus um, fillet technique, and wondered if you um, could maybe go into some of your slides about those different techniques and and show us a little bit of videos, kind of how you handle some of those cases and 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 when you might select one versus. And yeah, I mean, go ahead. Brad, as you're transitioning to that, we have one more question that popped up in the Q&A that I'm curious to get your opinion on before I tackle it as well, too. So um, just asking about using vascular loads or the white cartridges versus the blue uh, that was shown in the video. Do you have a, a preference on that and which way you go? Yeah, I mean, I, I use the I use used to use the blue, but now I we don't have those anymore, so I, I don't use white or blue anymore. I use the purple, purple. Uh, yeah. tri staple. <laughs> um, and for those of you who don't know, that's kind of a, a tapered alternating staple height. It's it's a little bit bigger the closing height on the outside than it is as it goes to the the middle. And the idea is to uh, improve tissue perfusion. The purple and the gold are kind of close to the blue. I don't, the, the size chart is a little bit different, but the purple is what we call a medium, vascular medium. And um, it overlaps with the blue. I want to say it goes like, closes down to like 0.7 to 1.2, somewhere in there, as I recall. Um, so that's what I use. I, I haven't used, um, you know, the white or blue. I haven't used the white ever. I've used the blue and now I yeah. use the purple. And the, the follow-up question to that is if the, the tan loads, which I guess are the gold, if those are too thin and I don't have experience with those. So I don't know if you, but that's what you're referring to is maybe a little bit larger. Yeah, I, th I think the, the gold or tan, whatever is medium thick. And I, okay. as I, I could be flipping that back. I'd need to pull it up and look, but I think those are medium thick. And then I, I think the the, scale just shifts a bit up. I really so wish we hadn't changed colors. That was hard to follow, but, uh, <laughs> but hopefully that got the idea. We don't take boards anymore. So I just open it up and look at it again when I need to Purple is a pretty color. Yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah, that's right. Okay, great, thank I, you. Do you want me to, I mean, I, I feel like I'm just talking too much, Bill. Um, so, I mean, my short no, answer I is- think... I... Go ahead. Yeah. Do you... No, I was going to say, do you want to bring up some of your videos just to kind of show through those, uh, at, you know, your approach to Kylos, I think. I think that's a, an interesting thing for us to, you know, obviously there's some slight controversy over what, whether or not we should do pericardectomies and, and what the benefit is for these cases. And I know people are, are pursuing clinical trials. <laughs> on that line. What's, your, what's your approach for uh, these cases? And then um, talk a little bit more about, you know, how you do yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think the question to do it or not to do it is more complicated than we think, but I'm going to skip that question because I, I think it depends on the case and it depends on what you're doing to obstruct the lymphatics. So we're, we're working on some stuff here. That's what Dr. Carvel's working. I know Phil's working on, uh, has been working on a prospective looking at that. So uh, we'll skip that question and assume we should do it. Um, when I do them for Kylos, I just make a, a big window and I fillet it now, like the almond paper said. I like that because it's quick, it's easy. And when you look at those, uh, you know, and the barber study showed it too. When you look at that, you know, epicardium, I mean, the whole heart is decompressed with that technique. I can't imagine that there's any amount of pericardium that's causing any kind of, you know, constriction and not allowing those ventricles to fill. So that's what I do um, because, you know, a subphrenic pericardectomy is great. It works great, but I think it is technically a little bit more time consuming, especially in a smaller dog. Um, you got the lungs getting in the way and most people don't want to tinker with one lung ventilation if you don't have to. And sometimes the pericardium is very opaque and it's hard to see where the phrenic nerves are. So I just assume not have to incise parallel along them for longer than I need to. Um, 
So that's my my short answer. This is just a, this is a really small dog doing a sub uh, sub Frenican. So it, they take a while in my hands, especially these smaller dogs. So the pericardial fillet, you know, as long as you get aggressive with it, is is technically easier, and I think it does the same thing. That's my personal opinion. Love to hear. What Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I start by making a smaller window and then just fillet it as much as I can. Um, one question I've been dying to ask you both uh, regarding colothorax cases is the positioning for these. And Bill, I know you mentioned early on, you're curious if we'd done the lateral approach to pericardectomy. And I haven't, and I, I think of it every time I do a colothorax case because I you know, do the thoracic duct with them in sternal and then flip them into dorsal for the pericardectomy. And every time I kind of kick myself for not having played around with it in a couple cadavers to see about that positioning, you know, whether it, the dream would be to keep the dog in, you know, sternal or oblique a little bit. So I'm curious if either of you have any experience with that type of positioning just from a time-saving standpoint, but I would imagine the exposure may be a bit of a, a pain and offset that the time advantage you'd get from not changing positions. No, I'm the same. I, so I'm, I hope somebody out there has the answer because I, I had the same situation where it's like you undrape or change their position, pop them up into dorsal. I think that it is, and, and, and then go, I do what I'm most comfortable with afterwards. And so, yeah, I don't know, Brad or anyone else out there, if, if you've had experience with doing this from a lateral aspect and, and thoughts. I have not, I've not done them from a lateral position before. Sounds like a good research project. We'll take some notes. <laughs> but yeah, if anyone else out there has, please chime in. Yeah, I'm also glad, you know, while people are thinking, I'm glad to hear, you know, this, I agree, the subphrenic, I always found to be challenging to do and time consuming and a lot of um, changes in, in what you have in what ports in order to kind of position things the way you need them to, to position. And so I have gone to doing the fillets as well. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that that's kind of other people are doing that too. So I think that's a uh, um, consider. The only thing I will say is that um, our April webinar is completely focused on chylothorax as well. So um, if people are interested in a, a further discussion on that, we will be talking about it as well in April. Nice plug. <laughs> Chris is just worried that we're going to keep talking about this in this <laughs> next webinar. Let's see. And we've got a comment from uh, Timothy McCarthy in the audience as well. Um, that, you know, the primary reason to not do pericardectomies is the need to reposition the patient. Um, this can be done with one positioning and draping using a tilt table. So he does a thoracic duct ligation and uh, pericardectomy in all patients at one surgery and in one position. All right, great. So, um, it sounds like Timothy, that's that's feasible um, from from what you're saying there. So it sounds like someone at least has done that. And then I guess I'd be curious to know: Are you obliquing them a bit into kind of a so you start with them in, in sternal and then oblique to uh, more of a lateral position? I would guess. But we can wait to see uh, what the update is there, and I'll relay that as we get more info. With our with our last um, minute or two here, a few minutes, I don't know, Brad, if you want to touch on some of the complications um, that you've encountered for some of these cases and cases and, uh, and maybe. What do you, what's a complication? What do you mean? <laughs> Just show um, all right. Um, let's see here. Uh, where are they at? Well, I mean, I mean, I, the devastating complication would be the arrhythmia and cardiac arrest. And I'm lucky I've not seen that. Um, I guess the next one would be severe bleeding. And I'm lucky there. I've not seen that. However, I have seen uh, intercostal port bleeding after a pericardectomy. Um, I don't have a good video of it, so I took one from a lung case that I did. Um, and so one of the things that I always do, and, you know, Dr. Monet, you know, preached this to me way back when, when I was a resident, and I've since preached it to everyone, is whenever you put a port in, make sure you're watching 
whenever you take a port out, make sure you're watching. And that's really important with the uh, uh, intercostal or pericostal ports because obviously, because the internal, um, the intercostal vessels. So this is one that, you know, it's kind of unassuming, but if you don't catch it, uh, you might regret it, you know, two hours later in the ICU when the chest fills up with blood and, that, and that's what they do. They, they bleed quite profusely. So I, um, I've definitely hit internal thoracics or been, been scrubbed in with people who have hit internal thoracics and it's pretty scary. So, you know, these are very similar. So make sure you're watching and, uh, you know, address them as you need to. Um, mo mostly it's not complications. It's just challenges, really small dogs. Like was said earlier, you know, English bulldogs. I got a case in here of a dog with a heart based mass. It was an English bulldog and the pericardium was super thick and there was no room like you were saying, Bill. And, um, so there's some, you know, little things that I use to deal with that, but not a lot of complications, um, other than, uh, bleeding. Anybody else? I was just going to ask what your preference is if you get a intercostal bleed. Um, I think I've had two now and both of them, I just did circumcostal suture, but was curious if you had any other thoughts on how you approach it. Yeah, I've done that. And I've also um, tried to get a small needle and try and get around it by trying to f feed through the skin incision. And I've actually worked in one case. I haven't seen a ton of them, but so I've done, yeah, what you've done and then uh, tried that as well. I know uh, Jeff Runge presented a, a, a complication of that. And then he just, he did some mixture of tamponade. I want to say, and just held it for a while and then, you know, uh, tied up the fascia on the outside and it stopped. So. I had one also that managed, and I don't know how complete a, a hole in that intercostal it was, but it actually responded to kind of prolonged compression. It wouldn't actually bleed when the port was in. This was a same mastiff um, with really, really wide ribs. And so we had a cannula that was in there and causing enough compression that by the time we removed it uh, seemed to be doing okay. So that's another probably lucky approach to that, but one, one success story there. Let's see. And, you know, I think um, a question, I can't type quickly enough to keep up with them, but um, just going back to your approach for pericardectomy, wondering about using the ligature. And, um, you know, I think it, you and I have both talked about using either ligature or harmonic um, for making that initial window. Uh, and it sounds like both you and I have been lucky and not experiencing fibrillation. Um, I guess that's the, the nice thing about the harmonic is because it's ultrasonic, you should be uh, relatively safe from that as long as you're, again, not adjacent to the heart um, with the bipolar vessel sealing devices, uh, a little more risk associated with that. I personally, I like that whether it's, you know, the thin tip of the um, ligature or um, the harmonic uh, tip, I do like the, the smaller fine tip to make that initial window or making the initial window with Metzenbaum scissors. And that way you can then um, get a little bit more traction on the pericardium to keep it away from the surface of the epicardium. Yeah, I completely agree. I do the same thing. I think that I've, I've had a hard time getting a good enough grip where I could feel like I could get the vessel sealer um, to get the window started. But I, like you said, I usually start with the scissors. And then from there, if I feel comfortable getting the vessel sealer in, I usually will try to try to do, um, try to do that. Well, that was it for, that was kind of the majority of the stuff that we wanted to, uh, to cover from our talk standpoint, but if there's any other questions or anything out there, we're happy to try to keep the conversation going or Val or Brad, if you have any. Yeah, that was really helpful. I think I got my questions answered. So uh, hopefully that's true for other folks in the audience, but feel free to shoot any more uh, last minute questions. And again, Chris, I think you'll be posting this on YouTube, right? For people who didn't get to catch it tonight. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this will eventually be on our YouTube uh, channel, similar with all the previous um, webinars that we've done. And then again, uh, just kind of two big reminders for people. So number one, we do have more webinars, one every month uh, so far scheduled, and then the World VES meeting. Um, with the abstracts information on the, the 
uh, World VES website. So other than that, that's it. Big thanks yeah, to, sorry, Brad. Uh, big thanks to CT and to Amit uh, Singh for all their efforts in, in making these happen. Um, and Nicole Buat as well for all, all that she's doing behind the scenes. Um, and then thanks as well to Brad and to Val um, for this. Yeah, thanks everyone. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, it's good to see all you guys. Uh, miss you all. I'm sick and tired of Zoom and you know being secluded. Um, but it's been fun. And uh, my email's up here along with Bill. So if anyone has any questions out there, just just send an email. And uh, yeah, thanks to all the attendees for showing up. And um, yeah, hope to see you guys all soon. Yeah, and keep in mind the meeting in June as well for those who can make it and uh, abstract submission till March 1st. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye, thanks.